Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Hello and thank you for joining us today. You are listening to Deeper, your daily Bible study. My name is Tim Rumsey, and I'd like to start today by just saying thank you to those of you that have expressed support uh, for Pathway to Paradise Ministries, either by your prayers, by your your comments or questions, uh, or even uh, financially. This uh, ministry does exist um, uh, by your generous support, and uh, we, we do thank you for those that have been able to um, support us in whatever way that has been. The title of our lesson today is Nehemiah Prepares for His Task. We'll continue looking at Nehemiah's arrival in Jerusalem and how he goes about beginning this work of finishing the building there that needed to be done. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we continue looking at Nehemiah's experience today, may we uh, hear your message to each one of us in our own lives, in our families, in our churches, and uh, may we take these lessons to heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, the title of our lesson is Nehemiah Prepares for His Task, and we're going to be looking at what Nehemiah did now when he arrived uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, He, of course, did not immediately begin to um, uh, rally support. He he had something he needed to do first, and um, I'm trying to talk and turn to the book of Nehemiah at the same time. It's kind of like rubbing your head and patting your stomach. at least for me. Here we are in Nehemiah chapter 2, and uh, I'm just going to start by reading the description that Nehemiah gives of his nighttime investigation of uh, the city of Jerusalem and the, the sad state that it was in. Nehemiah 2 verse 11 says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night, by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool. But there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. And so Nehemiah takes this uh, rather secretive nighttime tour of the city of Jerusalem to see for himself um, what needed to be done. And I suppose here is is a point number one that we can make, is that Nehemiah was not content to rely on the reports of others. Now, he, he did rely on those. He, he based his actions on those while he was still in Persia. But when he arrived in Jerusalem, he wanted to see for himself. And I think there's an important point here, an important lesson for each one of us in, in that Uh, When it is possible for us to investigate things for ourselves, to understand for ourselves if something that we have heard is really true or not, we should take that opportunity. And um, I know I've been guilty in the past at times of assuming things that weren't so or taking somebody's word for something. And um, sometimes we can get ourselves in hot water (laughs) because of neglect to um, investigate for ourselves. So, Good example laid out by Nehemiah here. We can understand why he was being so secretive as well. Uh, He didn't want to arouse the suspicion or the jealousy of his enemies uh, before he even had a chance to begin working. Uh, Now, again, the things that we're looking at uh, in in Nehemiah are lessons for us that can help um, make us effective spiritual leaders, whatever our area or realm of leadership is may be in. So let's uh, dive in a little more deeply here and look at what happens now as Nehemiah finishes this uh, nighttime tour of Jerusalem. Uh, How does he follow up with that? 
In Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, we can read what he says. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So he strengthened their hands, so they strengthened their hands for this good work. I think a couple of points uh, jump out at me here uh, as we look at uh, the verses we just read. First of all, Nehemiah is very honest about the situation. He uh, accurately and honestly summarizes the problem and the challenges facing God's people. And uh, certainly, the first step in dealing with any problem or situation is to squarely face that situation um, head on to do our best to understand what is going on, uh, to, you know, to understand the problem. Um, the, uh, you know, the first step in, in the 12-step alcohol recovery program is to admit that you have a problem, to admit that you need help. And um, the same thing applies spiritually for God's church today. Um, will we, can we, um, honestly admit that there are things that need to be addressed, that need to be changed within what is happening inside the church? You know, until we're able to do that, uh, the chances of making real progress and uh, coming back into, uh, you know, a place where God uh, can bless like he wants, it's, it's, it's pretty slim. And so we see here Nehemiah modeling a, a very good first step here of honestly summarizing the problem and the challenges facing them. Secondly, something else that comes out in these verses is that he gives them a good reason why the situation should be addressed. And that situation is that they nor God would no more be held in reproach. Again, he's, he's concerned, he's worried, he has a burden for the honor of God, the name of God. And he realizes that as long as these walls stay broken down, as long as these gates stay burned and unusable, it's not just the Jewish people that are held in reproach, it's also their God. Uh, and, and, of course, this is the most serious aspect of the problem, is that the uh, nations surrounding them had an excuse to bring reproach on God's name. Again, uh, I think the lesson is obvious and clear, that uh, our concern uh, as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians uh, today, should be primarily, first and foremost, for God's glory and His honor. Um, and if there's a situation or something happening within his body of the church that is bringing reproach uh, on that body, it's not just bringing it on us as Christians or as Christ followers today, it's also reflecting back onto God. And Nehemiah clearly is concerned about this and worried about this. And, uh, you know, as he speaks with passion and, and, and conviction to the, the leaders in Jerusalem, they, they catch the vision, they catch the urgency uh, of what needs to be done, and they become encouraged and motivated to complete the work of rebuilding Jerusalem as well. You know, this is a short speech that Nehemiah gives, but how effective it is. Um, they agree, yes, this is a problem. Yes, this is not good that God's name is being brought into reproach. So let us rise up and build. And they strengthen their hands uh, for this good work. Now let's uh, look at the uh, next verses, Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, and we'll see that again here comes some opposition. How does Nehemiah respond? But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us. And they said, Who is this, or what is this thing that they do? Will you rebel against the king? Well, we can stop right there. This is actually a very serious charge. Um, uh, you know, to be accused of treason against the government. Uh, the kings didn't take lightly to this uh, any more back then than they do today. And um, it was a very serious charge. Keep in mind also that uh, the political situation in that part of the Persian realm, we discussed this uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, there was already political instability. The king's brother, Megabizos, 
had rebelled or at least threatened to rebel against his brother, the king, Artaxerxes I. And so there was a lot of political unrest um, in that part of the Persian Empire to begin with. It would not have been probably a stretch for the king to become worried or believe that the Jews were also planning to participate in this rebellion. There's also the aspect of ridicule, isn't there? They laughed us to scorn and they despised us. You know, and you can read this and think, well, that's nothing, you know, let people laugh. Uh, But then, you know, how often do we allow ridicule and scorn from others to really influence and shape what we do um, as, as Christians or in other aspects of our lives? The issue of peer pressure and ridicule is a huge one. And, uh, you know, we often talk about it in in terms of the teenage years, but it doesn't go away, does it? Um, And yet God can give strength, he can give courage, and he can help us, he can bring us to the place where we really don't care what people say, as long as we know that we are in God's will. And this is really the place that Nehemiah appears to be in as he describes his response. He says this in Nehemiah 2 verse 20. Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. What a a bold, strong answer. Um, And I can imagine that as as they, they read or heard his reply, they started to get an idea of the type of person that Nehemiah was and of the character of the man that they were they're trying to intimidate. Uh, that's really what ridicule is. It's intimidation. Um, let's look closely at his response. How does Nehemiah respond first? By pointing to God in heaven, right? Not pointing to himself or, or what the others were trying to do. First, he directs the attention to God, which, of course, is where the attention should be focused. And he says, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Um, we get the feeling and the impression as we read through Nehemiah's experience here that he was not intimidated, that he was not scared. Now, what his personal emotions were, you know, uh, there may have been some apprehension, uh, some fear there, but he replies verbally um, or externally in a way that exudes um, complete confidence in God. I think this brings out another important point and is that our emotions and our feelings so often follow um, the things we do or the things we say. And so whether or not Nehemiah felt some fear or apprehension, he replies in a way of complete confidence in God without a shadow of doubt that God will prosper them. And um, it is true uh, that when we reply this way, when we place faith in God and express faith this way, that um, our feelings and emotions will follow as well. And then Nehemiah finishes by saying, Therefore we his servants will arise and build. There is no doubt there is complete confidence in Nehemiah's mind that he and his fellow Jews will accomplish the work, that God will allow them and enable them to do this. And so again he replies in a manner of complete confidence. And he finishes by saying, You have no portion, nor right, nor memorial, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, in other words, what, what he's really saying here, it, it's not so much a rude response, uh, I believe, as one of saying, listen, this is God's work. This is his people uh, that, that he is working through, that he is working for, and you are not going to be able to stop it. We need that same kind of confidence. We can have that same kind of confidence by God's grace today. And my prayer for each one of you today that is listening is that you can experience that, that God will give that to you, and that you can grow in that confidence and that faith in Christ. Well, we're out of time. Thank you for joining us today. I look forward to studying with you again tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.